and come forward for a children's sermon. Okay, boys and girls, if you're out there, <clears throat> I have a new rule, my New Year's resolution, so there's no confusion. If you don't come up for the children's sermon, you don't get one, okay? So don't come to me afterwards and say, I want one. This is for the children's sermon. Boys and girls, I want you to understand something. Lots of kids were born on Christmas Day. I checked it out. There was a bunch born. And I want you to see something. And each one of you take one. Now, don't open it, okay? But just hold this, okay? There should be one for everyone. Come here, girls. Come here. Come here. Oh, oops. I'm sorry. You guys are going to have catch over there. Here. Cheyenne. Did you get one, Jace? Okay, I'm running out. Okay, here. Here you go. No, she needs one. Bad. You need one bad. <laughs> Otherwise, i got to take it home. Okay, everyone has one, all right? Now, what I want you to do is look. I have checked this out. There are no two that are exactly the same, right? On Christmas, December 25th, there were a lot of babies that were born, and no two of them were exactly the same. But I want you to understand something. Only one, only one was the Messiah. Do each, any of you have the one that's the Messiah? It's hard to tell because they all look kind of similar. They have similar colors, right? I mean, they're all different. But God said, you know, I'm sending a special son. And his name was not um, Rhesus. It was Jesus. But he was a special son. He was different than any of the other kids. All the other babies that were born, there was only one. And God said, this is my son. His name is Jesus. And he is the Messiah. If anyone believes in him, he will be saved. Boys and girls, people will tell you as you grow up that you can get to heaven any way there is. But God said... There's only one. That one that was born on Christmas Day, that one is the only way. And his name is Jesus. That's right. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for sending your son Jesus so that we have a way to get to you and to get to heaven. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you guys on this uh, very warm day, and uh, it's good to see you guys came out for all this. Um, to start off the new year, Psalm 4-7 says, You have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and new wine abound. And this is a, an amazing song of praise that David <clears throat> lifts up because he's saying that, the gladness that you give me, the joy that you give me, is worth far more than any riches or any status of this earth. And for us to start this new year, a lot of New, year, new Year's resolutions come up, but a constant that we have from year in, year out, is the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. So we stand with us now for a time of praise and worship. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. You never change. You never fail, O oh God. True are your promises. True are your promises. True are your promises. You never change. You never fail, O oh God. But so we reign.
your love? What is your love and grace? What is your love and grace? You never change. You never fail, oh God. Let's sing that again. What is your love? What is your love and grace? What is your love and grace? You never change. You never fail, oh God. So we raise the holy hand. So we raise the holy hand to praise the holy one who was and is and is to come. Yeah, we raise the holy hand to praise.
we'll be seated for our last song. time to gather together to celebrate a new year but lord we celebrate every day a renewed life lord that you renew us day by day because your love and your grace have no bounds and so lord we just pray that as this day we celebrate that and worship you for that that each day we may live just completely redeemed lord that 
death could not hold you, therefore sin cannot hold us. Lord, let us live in a way that we are free, free from condemnation, free from sin because of you, Jesus. And we just thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Carl, uh, God works in mysterious ways because my meditation today is about the Lord's Prayer. Um, you know, it's a new year, and the question always is, what do we do with the resolution? Um, and I thought, as Christians, are we going to live under the old covenant or the new covenant? Um, and Jesus bought that for us, by the way. And so what does that new covenant address? And like Carl said, you can look in the Lord's Prayer, and it pretty much covers it all. But sometimes we don't know what those words mean, and so I did take the time to look up some of those words in the Greek and Hebrew. So if you want to follow along, it's in Matthew 6, 9 in your, in your Bibles. Uh, our Father which art in heaven. Heaven means his home, where he lives. Um, and it's full of happiness, power, and it, it's eternal. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed means he's innocent, he's blameless, he's pure. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <clears throat> the goodness of him is to be the same on this earth just as it is in heaven now. Give us this day our daily bread. Well, it means our provision for the day. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Well, that means that he has restored us to our former state just as we were are to, to restore those who owe us to their former state. Lead us not into temptation. Temptation means tests and adversity. Deliver us from evil. Evil means calamities. Essentially, uh, the effects of the curse. And if you'll notice in the text, there's a colon after evil. We are the subject of his deliverance by the blood of Jesus. And so now we are in his kingdom. We have access to his miraculous power. And we are his glory through which he shines his light to the world. So as we take communion, remember our new covenant, and let's pledge to walk in that covenant this new year. Dear Heavenly Father, as we uh, come before you and uh, partake of the bread and the cup, knowing you, you died on the cross for the deliverance for each and every one of us sins, and that by grace we can be saved. Lord, looking forward, help us to be emboldened by that, dear Lord to extend your kingdom, to let others know that there is hope, peace, and joy. And we'll just give you praise. In thy name, amen. All right, the song I'm going to sing this morning is called The Stand by Hillsong Worship. And um, it's a popular one in our youth group. And uh, we're going to sing it with you guys this morning uh, because we're going to start singing it together uh, here on Sunday mornings. So here we go. Completely 
sermon suggests just went ahead and made the bulletin. So I'm preaching from John chapter 6. So if you turn to John chapter 6, uh, I'm going to read verses 60 through 69. John 6, 60 through 69. Turn, uh, stand, if you would, for the reading of God's Word. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, and, and this is a dialogue that happens that I'll explain a little later. When they heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe, and who would betray him. And he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. From, and this is, I call it the John 666 verse. And it's one of the saddest verses in all of Scripture. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter, Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You may be seated. Um, these verses have been called many times the verses of Peter's challenge. 
And it's one thing after another in these verses. And I kind of want to set up how chapter 6 uh, starts and, and what this whole scenario is all about. Jesus has just lost a very important person in his life. John the Baptist has just been beheaded. The news gets back to Jesus and he is heartbroken. And he says, I need to get away. I just need to go by myself. I I need to grieve. The grief process started for Jesus, just like the grief process would start for us if we've lost someone really close to us. And in this moment, he decided he's going to get away. But a strange thing happens. People are following him all over, and they decide they're going to go with him. And so as he's going away, trying to be by himself, trying to grieve, All the people are coming along. And so there are three challenges that Peter faces in in, in this chapter, and and I want to go through them one at a time. The first one is the challenge of vision. Peter is watching Jesus and watching what he's doing, but he's having some struggles. Because as... Jesus is grieving, and Peter is watching the grieving. Jesus is also drawn to all these people and their needs. And one of the things that we have found that helps when you're grieving is turning your attention away from yourself and focusing on others. And so Jesus, as these 5,000 people are following Him, he realizes that they're getting hungry. And he realizes that, that these poor people are setting out in the sun, that they're drained, and, and he wants to do something for them. And, and Peter's kind of like, Jesus, really, uh, this should be more about us. Uh, we're, we're hurting. We should be thinking about us. And Jesus says, no, no, no. I'm going to think about them. And I'm going to help them. Go out there and find whatever you can and and we'll feed them. And as the story goes, and you know the story, they come back with a basket that they found the little boy had. It's basically a sack lunch. Two little fish, five loaves of bread, or pieces of bread. And they bring it to Jesus. And Peter right now has the challenge of vision. You know, some people can look at something and see what it can become. Others look at something and they see only defeat. Can't possibly make anything out of this. Peter's eyes were looking first at the basket, second at 5,000 people, and realizing this will not work. This cannot work. His vision was limited to what was right here. His vision was not going beyond this and seeing, wait a minute, Jesus is here. There's no telling what could happen with Him here. Many times our vision is limited too, isn't it? We look at our situation, we look at our circumstances, and the challenge for us is, Can we see what this could become? Can we see what God may make of this? Or can we only see the two fish and the five little pieces of bread and realize it can't possibly work? I can't tithe because I only have this amount of money. I can't possibly give it to God and and expect it to go any further, but... That's exactly how it works. Our vision needs to go beyond right here, and we need to see what can happen if we give it to God and see what He can do with it. Secondly, is the challenge of faith. Jesus says, look, the crowd's gone. I I have got to have some time alone. I want you guys to get in the boat Go on the Sea of Galilee. You go to the other side. And after a couple of days, I'll join you over there. And so, they start across. And lo and behold, a storm comes up. 
Oh, these poor disciples, they're scared to death. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And, and Jesus, all of a sudden, appears to them. And, and the, the statement that's made here j- just amazes me. Jesus says, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Now, I want you to look at the key to this. Take courage, don't be afraid. That doesn't mean anything if we leave out the it is I. He's the key. And our faith needs to understand. Remember the children's sermon. There's a lot of babies that were born December 25th. But there's only one that is the way, the truth, and the life. He says, it is I. And the I that's used here is the same I am that God used when he talked to Moses. It's I. Believe in me. I'm the only one you need. Oh, and Peter says, I, I want that. I, I, I want that. My faith is, is strong. Jesus, let me walk there with you. Come on, Peter, walk. And he gets out on the water. And Peter has one little problem. His faith is strong for a moment, and then he thinks about his circumstances. Wait a minute. The storm's brewing, the the wind's blowing, the waves are getting higher. I can't possibly be standing here on this water. And lo and behold, he starts to sink. How many times do we let our circumstances dictate to us what happens? Instead of rising above it and taking the words of Jesus to heart. Don't be afraid. You can handle this because I'm here with you. It is I. Oh, the challenge that Peter had that day. And yet something stuck because we come to the third challenge. And the third challenge is, to me, one of the most difficult. It's the challenge of going all the way. I mean, many people have a Christianity that goes a certain distance. But what about going all the way? Chris earlier talked to you about Austin, and the fact is, Austin, after three months, had earned a pass to come home. He was supposed to get to be here in church this morning. He was excited about it. He had called me and talked to me about it. But, unfortunately... Two other guys got a pass to go home a couple of weeks ago, and they failed their drug test when they got back. So all of a sudden, the rules changed. We've decided we're not going to give guys passes to go back, because when they get back, they go back into their old ways, they're around their old friends, and they're not strong enough yet, we've found, to say no. So we're not going to let you go home, Austin, until you've been here six months. We want you more grounded. We want you to be stronger in your faith. Austin said, I'm fine with that. Because I'm in this for the long haul. I'm going all the way. And that just rang so strongly to me because that's what Peter is facing here. I want to read the dialogue that goes on because after Jesus gets in the boat, they go to the other side and the crowd of 5,000 has all gone over there and they're waiting for Jesus. Now, here's the conversation that goes on. And this is read out of the new Amplified. And Amplified, it just takes the verses and makes it sound really modern and, but this is good. The critics say, when the Messiah comes, he will be greater than Moses. Moses fed a million people every day for 40 years with bread from heaven. You only provided one miraculous meal. Jesus conceded the point. You're quite right. 
But I want to tell you something. I am the bread from heaven. I have come to a world populated by millions of people living in a spiritual desert, and I am the source and substance of life for them. I am all they will need. Wow. Those verses are found before verse 60. And then we get to verse 60. And the disciples are troubled. Holy cow. You're saying that you're all we need? And all you did is just provide one little meal for us? We want you to feed us every day. We want to see more and more and more. And then a strange thing happened. Verse 66. 666 says, Many of the followers fell away. Now, shortly after this, there's another group that is fed. You know how many is in that group? 3,000. So that means 2,000 fell away. Almost half of the followers left because he wasn't doing things the way they thought he ought to do it. And the challenge now faces Peter. Wow, look at them all walking away. Look at them leaving right and left. Look at them going. 2,000 out of 5,000 is noticeable when they leave. He said, Peter, what about you? You with them? Or are you in this for the long run? Peter's words are telling. I got nowhere else to go. I look at Scripture and you're the one that we're looking for. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'm with you for the long haul. These challenges that face Peter have an ending where he says, I'm in it till the very end. And Peter is the only disciple that was crucified, but he was crucified upside down so that he would not be compared to Christ. I'm not worthy to be crucified like Christ. Crucify me upside down. I'm in it for the long run. How about you? I mean, your faith is always going to be tested, isn't it? There's always going to be things come up that, that make you question. And 2,000 of them that day left. But what about you? Had you been in that crowd that day, just having been fed this incredible meal, 12 baskets picked up afterwards, you saw a miracle right before your eyes, You've all seen miracles in your life. Every one of you. Your, your faith put to an incredible test. You're walking on water and you start to sink. Every one of you have been put through tests. And your faith has been tested many times. And then you're asked, are you in this for the long haul? Or is this just a temporary thing? And you're faced with the same thing day after day after day. What does this mean to me? The words of Joshua keep coming back over and over and over to me. As for me and my house, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That means I'm in it for the long haul. And it's not just about today. It's just about the rest of my life. I'm in it. I'm not a big fan of New Year's resolutions. But one resolution that, that I really have thought about and decided I want to do this year. I want to be a little bit more aware of those times when I experience Jesus. And instead of just simply saying, oh, well, I, I, that might have just been a coincidence. That might have just been a lucky thing. I want to be very aware so that I can say, yes, that's you. And I want more and more and more. That's the resolution we all ought to make. I want more.
of you, Jesus, more every day. Stand with me this morning.